Hello and welcome to Unstoppable. I am your host, Kerwin Ray. That's right, you heard me. And I am today talking to Dr. Shannon Chavez, who is a nationally recognized expert and sex therapist, educating and specializing in all things sexuality, including help for men, women, LGBTQIA, as well as couples. And in this conversation, we went everywhere when it came to sex. We talked about open relationships, sexual shame, pornography, how young people are being affected by the culture and technology, jealousy, addiction, parenting, and even risk, and how sex can actually be used as quite a therapeutic tool in order to heal our wounds, and how we need to start looking at sex differently if we're gonna start getting a different result. For those of you that have got an interest in sex, yes, I'm talking to every single one of you out there, and bar maybe one, this is gonna be interesting, so make sure you keep your eye on the road. Listen up. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com i've got to say well it is my honor and a great pleasure to welcome dr shannon chavez thank you very much for coming to unstoppable thanks for me. I'm oh, excited look, to be here. The moment I found out about you and what you do, I was like, this is a conversation I want to I wanna have. <laughs> so for people who perhaps don't know uh, who Dr. Shannon Chavez is or what you do, why don't you give us the, the 20, 30 second elevator pitch of, yeah, what do you do? Why are we here? Why are we here? You know, <laughs> yeah. I am a psychologist, a sex therapist. I think sex is so important mm. to our overall health and wellness. So I've developed my entire practice around helping people have better sex lives. Mm. I think having a better sex life really does improve your longevity, your, your relationships. So I'm really dedicated to helping people find that. Wow. It is such an important place. part of life. Oh, absolutely. That's how we all got here. uh, And and that's how we're going to continue to evolve as a species. Exactly, yeah. But it's interesting how it has been quite a taboo topic for for so long now. I know. Too long, yes. Well, where my curiosity lies, have you done much um, uh, research into the history of of sex? Because I'm curious to know, has it always been this way? Or was there a time in the world, because you, you look at some of the Greek, the Greek history where, exactly. you know, they would have these orgies and these fetish parties, fetish yes, parties and exactly. all these things. And it was quite an open environment. Uh, and I don't know if that was the world over and if the world just went through this conservative kind of season, you know, with, uh, with moving from, industri- you know, from agricultural to industrial. Yes. So I'm curious, like, has sex always been as taboo as what it has been today? No, I think you bring up a good point. So as our culture changes, yeah. so does sexuality. So it has gone through a lot of evolutions with people being more open and accepting of sexual diversity and then for people being more shut down and conservative around it. I think a lot of it has to do with religion and cultural beliefs and, and just what society is going through at that time, in that moment. So I think it's always evolving, but I think sometimes we're going backwards instead of forwards, especially yeah. with where we're at now. And that's why I'm excited to have this conversation and explore that. Right. But I guess my curiosity lies in how did <laughs> how did, we, did you get into this? Like how did you Someone become this work like one of the top <laughs> sex therapists in the US? <laughs> you know, I've always been curious about sex. I yeah. was that kid asking questions, embarrassing my parents, and always wanting to know. Yeah. But I grew up Catholic and conservative, and I knew it made people uncomfortable. So because I was comfortable talking about it, I thought, why wouldn't anyone want to do this work? Aren't we all going to be having sex? And I knew I wanted to work with couples as I started to specialize in psychology. And how are you going to address couples' issues without talking about sex? Yeah, right. So I I really wanted to make it a focus. I want people to understand that sex is more than just what we're doing with our bodies, but it's a part of our overall health and well-being. At what point in your your life, though, did you actually go, okay, I'm not just curious about sex, (laughs) 
She don't want to be a doctor of sex. I actually I first, want to help people with sex. When I discovered it was an actually a career, I said, that's what I want to do. How that old were you when like that happened? That sounds like the most fascinating career. I think I was about, I was about 18. There was okay. this woman on the radio, and she was a sex therapist local in town. And I remember hearing her radio show, and she's interviewing people. And I thought, that's a real thing. You can talk to people about sex, and that's a career. So I actually ended up working for this woman. And I helped her with her book writing. And, and so she was a great mentor to me. And she said, absolutely, you should do this work. So wow. I never looked back. There was never a plan B. It was always what I wanted to do. Okay. <laughs> and then you, you go to school, you yes. train. Yes, yes. Lots of training. And yeah. I think that's important for people to know. To become a sex therapist, you have to do your own work. Yeah. You have to make sure that anything that Let's comes classify the that. Because when we say we have, to, <laughs> you have to do a lot of work as a sex therapist, it's like the psychology work, the self-work. The Self-work, yeah. exactly. What pushes your buttons? Mm. You have to expose yourself to different material and sexuality so you can be comfortable with it, mm. to see where your own values lie, what things that are, are button pushers that might not be a good fit for you. And every therapist has that, and I think that's important to yeah, you. Right. you know, we all have different niche areas we work in, and some people are better fit for certain issues, and I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, right. So what are some of the main reasons that someone might come and see you, whether it be an individual yes. or a couple? Yes, very good question. There are so many common concerns, but what I see the most is probably low desire. Okay. And that can be, I'm just not finding any libido or interest for sex. Uh, I also see a lot of communication issues around sex. Couples that are being passive or not direct in what they want, so they end up being bored or dissatisfied with sex. I see that quite often. Okay. I also see sexual dysfunction, and that can be genital issues. So for males, that may be erectile dysfunction, early ejaculation, uh, issues with performance anxiety, things mm. like that. For females, it may be pain, discomfort, orgasm issues. We kind of work with all of it. We kind of work from the head all the way down to, to the feet. So every aspect of what may go wrong in, in sex and address those issues. Okay, because mm -hmm. it's interesting that we look at sex and psychology in the same, in the same sentence, Absolutely. and especially as a discipline and, and as, a, as a medicine. But I'm curious to know, with the people that have these problems, you know, oftentimes when some people have problems, you know, they don't know that they're a problem. Exactly. You know, they're either undiagnosed or they just go, oh, look, it's just how it's always been or it's, they, they generalize or they deflect it away. Yes. What I'm curious to know is for people who have some of these issues, like what are some of the consequences of these issues mm -hmm. that if you don't treat them or if you don't actually do your work, yes. what can actually happen? Like what are some of the things that you've seen play out? That's such a good question. If you don't address them, I see things like shame right. and discomfort. People may even identify as someone that's asexual. So I just don't feel that sexuality is important to me. I'm not interested. They can feel very disconnected from their body. I see a lot of people experience psychological trauma from yeah. sexual issues. So they may feel isolated. They may feel they're the only ones dealing with this issue. Yeah. And I, I think that's a big problem too because society tends to uh, categorize everything around sexuality. So that leads to a lot of mental barriers around how people view themselves as sexual beings. Yeah, right. I think also in coupleship, there's a huge problem. I see couples that have not addressed these issues for 15 years plus, and then they end up just having a, a, a poor relationship to sex and sexuality. Why do you think people avoid addressing the issues? Is it because of the, sh the potential shame yes. involves? The shame, yeah. the taboo, the discomfort. What does it mean for me that I yeah. have a sexual issue? Am I issue? less than? Exactly. Yeah. Ego is a big <laughs> problem in sexuality. Is it different working with men than women, have you found? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. What are some of the key differences when you're working with men versus women? I think men are conditioned to look at sex from a very performance-based model. And okay. that means the penis is the star of the show and it's all about penis functioning for sex. So that can limit how someone experiences sex. Because if your genitals are not doing what you want them to do, sex is a failure, not working, I'm not good, then they internalize those messages about who they are. Yeah. And so that's a problem. It really limits their experience to explore and expand their sexual potential. Yeah, right. And women are different. I mean, women are conditioned to think of sex as uh, an emotional experience. They are taught that they have less desire than men. These expectations that end up limiting their ability to be free and open with sex. 
And the, the libido desire issue, that's probably the biggest one I see with men and women. You know, women saying, well, men are more sexual than we are, or you know, it's, it's normal that women have a low drive, and so they internalize those messages and end up avoiding sex, right. limiting their, their sexual potential. It's almost like sex has started to become quite a complex thing. You know, because once upon a time, you were either male or a female, and you were either, you know, straight or gay. <laughs> and now, you know, we have a whole range of diverse categories that you yes. can put yourself into right. and identify with. Do you think that's actually serving us as a culture to help us create a better understanding of ourselves by do having that level of segmentation? Mm -hmm. Or do you think we're actually losing, we're losing a lot in the detail by looking too closely versus just, to, you know, maybe stepping back? Mm -hmm. I like the idea of people identifying so specifically because I think for the first time people are seeing that sexuality is a big part of spirituality, mm. personhood, you know, who I am and the path I want to live in my life. And that, if that helps you to have an identity that is specific, that means you have community and people that understand yeah, who you right. are. That helps heal shame more than anything. I've seen people find a, a classification or identity of who they are, and it just changed their entire life. And so, I guess with the advent of social media, that's where communities right. really come into it as well. Right, absolutely. It's, it's at our fingertips yeah. to find people who are like me. I mean, yeah, that's what yeah. people want. Am I normal? Is this the, am I the only one dealing with this issue? Okay. And I think they need communi community to heal. So how do we do the work? And I guess this is going to be a very tricky question because every we're, we're, we're like thumbprints uh, and everyone's unique. But let's say someone's listened to this conversation so far and they've gone, okay, I can identify with that. Oh, I can relate to that. Oh, shit, maybe I've got some work that I need to do. Maybe it's not a massive issue that's causing huge drama, but it's enough for them to go, mm, that's something I really should have done something about. Like where do you think is the best place for people to start when they're looking at addressing any of the issues that are affecting sexual performance? You know, I think start with where you're at now because right. we tend to look at what has happened in the past or what used to be, and that can be just anxiety provoking. Start where you're at now. What's going on now in your life? Examine that. Am I happy in my sex life, in my relationship? Am I lacking in a certain area? And what do you want to change now? Mm. Self-awareness is such a big part of sexuality, being aware of what that is. Often we tend to put that, that on the, our external environment, right? You know, my partner needs to be the one to turn me on. It's this or that is, as to why I'm not experiencing my full sexuality. And I think we have to be more self-focused. Mm. And that tends to be the first start. So and that's let's start with often you. the most uncomfortable as well, yeah? Exactly, exactly. Even when I'm working with a couple, I want to see who they are individually first. Okay. I'll do a, a sex history. I'll get an assessment of their whole health. I want to look at their entire being, not just what's going on sexually, because there's a lot of parallel between what's happening in your sex life and what's happening in your day to day. Okay. Does anyone ever come to you and go, look, I feel like there's just something wrong with me. And then you go, okay, fine. And then they tell you everything. You go, no, you're normal. Yes. Yeah. Most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Wow. And there's so much embarrassment because again, yeah. it's not really normal normal yeah. for us to talk to a stranger about sex, yeah. right? Hey, here's what I like or enjoy or desire or fantasize. It's become such a private experience mm. for people to experience sex. Even things like masturbation. How often do people say, hey, this is how I masturbate or this is what, how I touch my body to bring me pleasure? It's not very common. Mm. So it's, it's so taboo to even talk about it, but once they do and they hear the fact that this is something most people do, or males do this, females do that. It's common for your body to respond this way. There's so much relief. They can relieve years of trauma just by hearing mm. the words, you are normal. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It can be quite therapeutic and cathartic. Absolutely. Are you seeing an evolution in some of the issues that we're dealing with of a sexual nature mm -hmm. as we evolve as a species mm -hmm. with obviously you know, parallels like technology, yes. internet? Mm -hmm. What are you seeing? Huge changes in communication, first yeah. off. Okay. Uh, text communication and also the benefit that technology can bring. So it can change communication, but the benefit can be we can use technology to improve 
intimacy right. to improve sexual So how will we use technology to improve intimacy? That's a great question because a lot of people go, oh my God, get the technology out of the house. It's, right. it's killing our intimacy. Right. How do we use it to actually increase That's intimacy? That's actually a good point. It's a balance. Yep. So it's not I'm on my phone while my partner is giving me a massage or pleasuring me, but it's more can we use things like devices and apps to play with our partners. And, and by play, I mean there are texts got I've got to talk to that because um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but I had a partner once that said the same thing. She actually showed me the app. She goes, oh, this is an app of vagina. And this actually, this app shows you how to stimulate the clitoris, yes. you know, in order to, uh, you know, achieve our orgasm. Because most men just assume up, down, up, down, side, side, side. It's a little button. They don't a little know button. the anatomy. <laughs> yeah, you just press it. Uh, whereas this app was really incredible as a, as a use of technology to show how to, you know, uh, <laughs> circle the clitoris, how to draw up and down. Exactly. And it was literally this how to. And I remember looking and going, Okay, wow, first of all, there's probably a lot of guys out there that really need this, but I wouldn't have even thought of creating an app of yes. how do you stimulate a clitoris. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where technology is going for the positive yeah. is education, awareness, tools that can help you enhance what's already going on. Yeah. So it doesn't want to be something that takes you away from your partner in connection, but that can enhance and be interactive with a partner. Okay. So for example, they have apps that can be connected to a pleasure device. For example, things that can be look like a panty, a panty liner that a female can wear in her undergarments. Oh, I'm loving it. And <laughs> the partner can control that yeah. Bluetooth technology from a completely different place. Wow. I love the excitement, the the variety, and just the, 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 the playfulness that that brings. So yeah, that's couples need... I think variety and novelty in their sex lives. That, I think, is the biggest concern for monogamy, yeah. is sexual boredom. Really? Absolutely. People are bored with the same old routine. We do sex the same way. It happens at this time of night. We're always in the bed. He initiates. She does this. And so it becomes a script yeah. and something that just doesn't have any mystery or variety. And people get bored. Mm. And with boredom, what do we do? We avoid we lose interest, we don't feel as much reward and motivation. And some seek excitement mean? in other areas. Yes. For that same boredom. Exactly. Yeah, right. right. And so technology can actually provide a new level of variety exactly. okay, and novelty exactly. that wasn't there before. Right. It can just kind of enhance. And, and again, I, I really love sex toys. I think they've gotten a bad rap in culture as far as how to use them, what they're used for. But I think every body yeah. can use a vibrator. Everybody can explore and use different sex toys. So it's not just for your genitals. You can use it on any part of your body. So a lot of the work I do with couples is around sensual focus. How do yeah, right. we engage the senses, wake up the body, and why not use a vibrator? It's interesting because I remember uh, how vibrators used to be marketed going back in the 60s and 70s. Yes, that's the problem area, Yeah, right? it was like, you know, here is your special little <laughs> vibrating tool to massage your shoulders, you know, it's a, and it's the shape of a banana. I was like, yeah, wow, that's... Or it was, was a big jelly felic shaped <laughs> object that was embarrassing with packaging that people wanted to hide. Now they're in high-end stores. You can get yeah. beautiful products. They look like jewelry. I mean, they're really beautiful. You can get them gold-plated, exactly. you know, linked to your iPhone. Engraved. Yeah. Whatever you whatever you want. So I guess there's, <laughs> there's also another side to technology as well that hasn't supported um, the evolution of sex or perhaps has, I won't say hasn't supported, it's perhaps just taken us in a in a direction that maybe some of us didn't see before. And with the advent of technology, obviously the internet, with the internet, we now have access to information we've never seen before, which is great in many respects to be able to, you know, get access to the Kama Sutra or to Tantra. Yeah, right. But we also get now get access to things like pornography. pornography. And we've got, you know, I'm not going to say there's good pornography and bad pornography, but it would probably be fair to say that you could almost categorize it in that way where you've got mm -hmm. pornography that could be quite helpful and supportive and healthy. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other pornography that could be, and I'm not going to say is, but could be deemed to be unhealthy and perhaps even something that could be damaging. Yes. Like, would you agree with that or? Yes, yes, yes. Pornography is entertainment. So right. there are lots of varieties in different forms. But the issue is, if that's your only source of exposure to sexual behavior, you can develop unrealistic expectations. This is what's happening right now oh, with kids, absolutely. right? absolutely, yes. Yeah. Because they have no, ed, no sex ed, so yeah. they're seeing porn, and then that becomes their imprinting of what sex should be. Mm. Or even performance issues, right? Males in porn have large penises, or they're able to do this, last long, do all these things, make 
make a woman orgasm, squirt, all these, these uh, behaviors, and it creates shame if they're not able to do that. Or they may go into sexual relationships with those expectations. Right. Sex has to look like this. And there's no intimacy in, in porn. But there are good sites that are coming out, like a, a website called Make Love Not Porn, where it's about real couples and different bodies and not so fantasy driven, which I think can be a great source yeah. of, of education. For are you starting to see a shift in the dynamic of the types of issues that are coming through from the younger demographics mm -hmm. as a result of the early exposure to porn? Yes, absolutely. Things like erectile dysfunction, okay. uh, a lot of anxiety around performance, uh, just feeling uh, low sexual self-esteem. Yeah, right. I don't feel good enough, sexy enough, strong enough, masculine enough. All of these issues are coming because So it's almost porn. like porn has become the Instagram of sex. <laughs> yes, Everyone's that's, comparing. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yes. Right. And it's uh, the fantasy component being that porn is is again, showing parts of bodies and not the interaction that people experience for sex. Rarely do we see communication, negotiation, boundary setting, uh, how couples actually navigate all the different stages of a sexual experience. Yeah, right. We see the money shot or the high entertainment shots of pornography, but we don't see any of the buildup. Mm. The, uh, the, again, the intimacy around how people actually have sex. Because it seems to me that like uh, there's the possible, the potential for a whole generation to be coming through to, a th to be not even understanding or knowing what foreplay is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They focus on again the orgasm, the mechanics of sex, but not the uh, components of sex that are the emotional, the even the energetic. You know, yeah. sex is about this really primal experience, but we don't really see that in pornography. Do you introduce much, uh, I guess, tantric mm -hmm. methodology or mm -hmm. technology to what you do and in, in what way? I do. I love tantric sex. I think it's so helpful for yeah. people. Things like breathing, grounding. I think it's there's a lot of mindfulness. And what I like about tantra is that it doesn't focus entirely on the genitals. So it goes back to that point that sex is a whole full-bodied experience. It starts with the breath. And it expands mm. people past, uh, again, the goal-oriented way of viewing sex. It focuses on pleasure, pleasure being so many other forms of connection. And people really need that. I, they're what they're craving, I believe. Yeah, look, really I would agree because I think sex is quite therapeutic if it's used the right way. Yes. But most people use sex as a race to the finish. Exactly. You know, and that's one of the things that I love about Tantra. Like I picked up Tantra totally by accident after a breakup. Um, and it was one of the most incredible experiences. Like when, the moment I started studying Tantra, I went celibate for, for eight months. Oh. Uh, and it was, again, an, an incredible experience for me. <clears throat> but what I started to, to, to really delve into was understanding my sexual energy, mm. understanding my desires, understanding my you know, ability to also direct that energy, not just be a victim to that energy. Mm. Uh, and it was an incredibly enlightening experience for me. And I actually found it gave me a, a sense of purpose greater than I'd, almost than I'd ever had before, a sense of clarity. Mm. Why is it then when we, when we do learn how to you know, I guess, harness the power of sex, that it can be used as, as quite a powerful force in other areas of our life. Mm -hmm. I think something like that can teach you control and awareness of your emotions. Mm. And I think where people are really stuck today is this overstimulation, instant gratification culture where they're not really present they're not really connected to their bodies. There may be this mind-body disconnect of my mind and what I want, my desires, and then what my body's actually doing. So I think there can be this integration that comes from tools that you learn through Tantra. And, it's and that's what I loved. I, I love the fact that it wasn't about, the goal wasn't ejaculation. Exactly. The goal was actually an amplification mm -hmm. of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you take ejaculation out of it, it, it almost changes the game completely. Exactly. Because it's no longer... Like I found, well, you know, you're no longer having sex as quickly. Like you're not, you exactly. know, pounding it out, so to speak. You're actually mm -hmm. slowing it down and you're taking more time and, and you're taking more interest. Exactly. Um, and it becomes a far more pleasurable experience uh, without, in some cases, the need for or the requirement for ejaculation. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something you're seeing coming through as more of a trend? You know, I know living in LA, you probably see tantras everywhere. <laughs> Yes. But from a therapeutic side, obviously we've got a lot more alternative medicines coming through now, but are you seeing Tantra to becoming a, a more important part of sexual therapy moving forward as a species? Yes. People are hungry for something outside of that, and I think they, they, 
we are at a very spirituality focused point in our culture. And what that means is people are looking for more purpose in everything that they're mm. doing. So Tantra fits in with that. And I think it also satisfies our hunger for uh, something different, mm. something deeper, and something that's fulfilling even outside of physical gratification. Because it was Napoleon Hill. Have you read Think and Grow Rich? I have, yes. There's a lot of sex references in that. Well, that's how I got into, <laughs> onto Tantra. Like, Because um, I I'd had a breakup okay. and I was devastated because I'd never been dumped before. And I'm sitting on the bed, heartbroken after a week and a half. And I used to sleep with um, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, beside my bed. It's been read like a hundred times. It's dog-eared, it's underlined. It's, but I, what I didn't realize is whenever I read the book, whenever I got to the end chapters, that's when I would always lose interest. And I never really consumed with as much vigor the end, of ch- end chapters, chapter 11, Sex Transmutation, as the earlier chapters. And I was sitting there in pain. I was like, I need help. And all of a sudden I just looked to my left and I saw the book. And I was like, okay, I don't know how Napoleon's going to help me, but I'm game. <laughs> and I picked up the book and I held it in my hands and I put it to my head and I said, Napoleon, I'm asking for your help. I said, I, I'm in pain right now and I, I would like your help to help end, end the suffering. And then I just allowed the book to open and it opened bang on, chapter 11, the, the chapter. power of sex transmutation. Because <laughs> yes. at the time I was quite a very, and I still am a very sexual person, but I'd say I was a little bit sexually undisciplined. Mm-hmm. You know, if I saw a beautiful woman, I would look. I would fantasize. You know, if I wanted to release and I was by myself, I would release. You know, if I wanted to have sex with a beautiful woman, I would. But I found out that there was this, almost like this, um, undisciplined child that was at the controls of the sexual panel. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, I need, to, I need to actually rein this back in. I started reading the chapter and I read that chapter four times that night and it was the very next morning that I started studying Tantra. But flipping back to Napoleon's take on it, which is what I find really interesting, he connects sex drive with the ability to create success. Mm-hmm. And he identified that of all the 500 wealthiest people that he interviewed, they all had very high sex drives. Mm-hmm. Now it's funny because when I say this to people in an audience and say, okay, you know, if that if a high sex drive is all that's required to, to achieve success, who's already there? And it's like 80% of the room, like, wow, if that's all it takes, then I'm all ears. But what, what's interesting is he says they learnt to take that sexual energy and to focus on the things other than the act, mm-hmm. other than the fantasy, other than, you know, the solo expression, mm-hmm. you know, and learn how to have an external feature, like a beautiful woman or a, a beautiful man, and allow them to fill them with charge. Mm-hmm and then direct that towards some form of creation. Yes, and it's I couldn't almost, agree more. Yeah, right. I think there is no libido that is just sexual. I think libido is our life force, and mm. we put it towards anything that we're passionate yes. about or that we desire. And sometimes here's the issue with sex, is that we're putting it towards our careers, our families, our, our passions, our, our hobbies and interests that we neglect our sexuality in. And that's where sometimes we just have to redirect it back mm. or realize that we can utilize that energy towards our, our sex life by being creative. Absolutely. Creating experiences that work for us, like we do with our work, like we do towards the things that we want to be successful in. And that's important. You know, sometimes people dis, uh, separate the two and say, you know, I'm great at this, but not at sex. And they start these limiting beliefs about their sex life instead of realizing it's all connected. I, I think sex is one of the most powerful procreative forces that, that, we, that, that we've been given because it has the power to create life. I agree. But to echo what you just said, I think a lot of us have been misled to realize that it's not just a power to create life. Mm-hmm. It's a power to create. Mm-hmm. And that sexual energy could give birth to not just a child, but could give birth to a very successful business. It Absolutely. could give birth to you know, a very successful invention. There are so many things that can be created when we learn how to capture our sexual energy and direct it into the right areas. Yes. So when you're working with someone, because I'm going to assume sexual discipline is something you, or sexual mm-hmm. undiscipline, mm-hmm. is that something you see? Absolutely. In the context of what we're talking about here? Right. As so, you're saying, you know, people can get these compulsivities and ways in which they're using sex that yeah. can be unhealthy for them. They, uh, for example, uh, using sex to cope with anxiety, to cope with past trauma, to cope with things that are uh, not about pleasure, but about regulation. Mm. And because of that, there are better tools to do that form of regulation and then to utilize and use that sexual energy for what it's, what it's created for. Which I guess we're talking about now, sex addiction, mm-hmm. you know, which is, uh, I'm going to assume with the advent of technology and media and everything else, people are starting to now perhaps maybe identify mm-hmm. Before, let's say, one, before perhaps someone just thought, well, no, I just have a high libido. Right. And now they're perhaps just going, oh my God, I'm actually using sex as a drug. Yes. Because I'm trying to suppress a past trauma or a present trauma or deal with a, a current situation. How do we distinguish 
between having a high libido yes. and actually the, having the potential of being a sex addict? Mm -hmm. Good question. I mean, there's a lot of divide in the field about sex addiction. I'm sure you've heard different things and how we I think addiction in general is a, is a can of worms. Yes. Yeah. yes, and I think it's not just sex. I mean, anything can claim our consciousness and we can use mm. things to cope with uh, things that we don't want to deal with. So I think with sex addiction or people that use sex or pornography or masturbation as a way to cope, they just need to understand what it is they're, they're avoiding. So usually at the root of that, there are triggers, there are things that people can become self-aware of, and sometimes it's unconscious. Actually, most behaviors that drive addiction are unconscious. Mm. So I see it more as of an anxiety disorder or compulsivity, similar to obsessive compulsive disorder that can be managed through mindfulness-based work, cognitive behavioral therapy. But it's less about the the sex, it's just sex has been used as the vehicle to get that relief. Mm. So uh, for example, people that are in recovery, so to speak, from sex addiction, they may abstain or avoid sexual behavior, but another process will come in to start uh, coping with the same mechanism. Is, there also, is it also fair to say that the, one of the distinctions you might see between just a high libido and sex addiction is risk? The, the amount of risk that people will take in order to have their needs satisfied? Absolutely. One of the hallmarks we look at for diagnoses or assessment is you're uh, engaging in risky behaviors despite any negative consequences. Mm. So it tends to escalate and there becomes less fear of, of consequences. And that's where people tend to hit rock bottom or really uh, you know, blow up or destroy their lives mm. because there's just absolutely no uh, awareness or boundary around that. And then they may, may escalate and escalate because the need for that relief is so great. So mm. that's the unconscious driver that... Uh, and like you say, then it's becoming quite a destructive force in relationships and... Exactly. And I think yeah. it's important for people to know that infidelity and high drive and sex addiction is not an excuse for that. I tend yeah. to see that a lot. Uh, yeah, people that right. have betrayed a partner or having an affair. And they go, I'm a sex addict. I'm a sex addict. <laughs> yeah. That's me. You know, I need help. But instead of accountability and really owning ah, right. the choices that they made. And that's, that's a problem. That's a good point. Do you see that a lot? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I think the media has done a great job yep. of adding to this problem by, uh, again, whether it's celebrities that have identified as sex addicts or quickly rushing a, a person into sex addiction treatment to avoid scandals and it's a problem because again mm. it confuses the actual need for help that some people have around compulsive behavior or out of control behavior. So in your situation when you identify someone's perhaps got a, more of a pathological issue around it mm. and it's an addictive tendency mm. like what's the first step? Like Yes, we, we kind of want to look at the entire behavior and how it functions. I like to do a behavior containment model, and that may be just looking at how it functions as what triggers it, what do you actually do to, uh, to act out, so to speak, or what are your behaviors, whether it's compulsive masturbation, isolation, all the things that the person is doing to cope with those triggers. And then help them learn healthy dependency, healthy sexuality, learn how to regulate self-regulation, emotional regulation. A lot of it's skill building and a lot of it's helping them understand how the behavior works. Because I'm curious, because I'm an, I'm an addict, I'm not a sex addict, um, although it's questionable in the past. Uh, <laughs> not I just, funny, I'll, but... I'll, 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 no, I just claim, I high, I claim high libido. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what I'm curious, oh crap, where was I going? Uh, sorry, what did you say? Well, you were saying with addiction. Oh, with addiction. You know, um, being an addict myself um, of a of a substance nature, mm -hmm. you know, I know one of the most important things, you know, for me is to be healthy is abstinence. Mm -hmm. You know, to to not go to the substance mm -hmm. that you know causes me that that issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the biggest challenges I've seen working with addicts and also with myself is oftentimes when it comes to the crux of okay, I've now identified I've got a problem. Okay, I've got to do some work. This thing that I thought was my friend is no longer my friend. Okay, I've got to say goodbye to you. Okay, and, and, and there's that relationship that is broken. And, you know, with that, you then learn how to develop new relationships in other ways with other substances exactly. that you ideally um, generate yourself. Sex, though, is not in the same ballpark, really, mm. because it's a part of our everyday life. And it's not like it can say, well, alcohol is a part of our everyday life. Well, not really. It, it is and it isn't. But when we look at sex, you know, if someone's a sex addict and they go, well, I'm a sex addict, now I have to claim abstinence, does that mean I never have sex again? 
Exactly. That is my biggest critique of these treatment models that look at sex as an addiction because it's not a, a chemical substance you can just take away and avoid and be and abstain from. It's a part of our being. So if you have people abstaining from masturbation and every sexual behavior, I think it can sometimes drive that anxiety to even higher levels. So it's not about replacing it or abstaining from it, but helping that person have a better relationship with it. So we're not using sex anymore to cope with intolerable feelings. Let's look at what healthy sexuality is. Let's replace that and develop a mechanism to deal with those emotions, but then also learn what sex is really about for you. So and that may be learning a pleasure model, right. learning how to communicate needs, learning how to be vulnerable, which can help improve sexual health. So what I'm hearing you say is for an addict, it's not about saying goodbye to sex. It's about learning how to use sex in a more healthy way. Yes, absolutely. And learning how to regulate the emotions and the pain and the trauma that we were using sex for mm -hmm. in new and healthier ways. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so much of that comes from the, the therapeutic relationship, mm. being able to talk about it, being able to open up about things that have been stuffed away or disconnected from, from who you are. And that heals a lot of the trauma by just being able to say, yes, this is all connected and this is part of how I developed. Mm. And my, this is my wiring and this is why I'm, I'm prone to use this to regulate myself or this is why I escape with sex or fantasy or porn. So helping people make the connections can be so healing. It's interesting, you just made me think of something because we've got sex addiction, mm -hmm. but we've also now got something coming through as well as porn addiction. Porn addiction. Yeah. Yes, compulsive porn use where people are, and I think there's three reasons why porn is a problem for people. It's very easy to access. It's at our fingertips anywhere. We never yeah. had this problem in any point in our history. Also, anonymity. You can go online and you can just be uh, different mm. personas. You can log in, chat, find and access information and nobody knows. So there's no shame involved in that. It can be this very private experience where you don't have to deal with vulnerability or what people will think of you if you're into that or like this or look at that. And then, of course, uh, affordability. It's free. So uh, we're not paying for porn anymore. So, it, again, the accessibility of that and how easy it is and how it's marketed to us is, is a problem. Mm. Okay, cool. Again. So technology again. Um, <laughs> our good friend, our, our bad good friend, friend technology. Our bad friend, well, it is what it is. It's both. It's it is neutral. What it is. It's, exactly. it's, a, it's a powerful weapon and it's an incredible bomb. <laughs> we need it and we can't live without it, yes. <laughs> um, but it's interesting when you look at how we meet now, because you know, once upon a time, in order for us to meet, we'd have to bump into each other at the same village send or at the campfire. Yes, at a telegram. <laughs> okay, or it would be at the, uh, the Queen's Ball once a year. Um, whereas now, you know, we can. Can, we can connect, as you say, at our fingertips. You know, Tinder, right. you know, has become a big thing when it comes to, okay, I no longer need a relationship, I just need Tinder, mm -hmm. and I can just, if I want to have sex, I'll just go on a, 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 a Tinder date. Now, I know there's a word for it, they call it within Tinder. I don't know what it is, I can't remember it right now. But it's, uh, Matthias, what's that word that is used for Tinder for the one night stand? I don't know. I, I can't remember. But anyway, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about it later. But what I'm finding interesting now, especially with the younger demographic, is they, they, they seem to be looking at um, relationships now very much from a consumption perspective. Yes. You know, it's, Quantity once, versus quality. Absolutely. Yeah. Like once upon a time, like I know for me, <laughs> I've, I'm, my whole life, I can't wait to meet this one. Blah, blah, blah. You know, that, you have that fantasy of not yeah. being with lots, with, with being with one, which is interesting how I got to where I am. But uh, I see with Tinder coming through now, it's just becoming almost like this, you know, uh, this life of uh, we're, 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 we're choosing off a catalogue. Um, not so much with the intent for a connection, but for the intent to just, I guess, fuck. Exactly. We objectify people, right? Yeah. Do I like what I see? And it's so easy to swipe, the swipe culture, right? I can swipe away and not be interested, and then I can swipe towards something that I'm interested in. So we objectify and fantasize more than we ever have. So we look at a picture and we may say, oh, this is a... Whatever you see, you know, hot, attractive, perfect, we're going to have all these amazing sexual experiences or attraction. And then uh, the reality is you may not know how to have a conversation with that person. So we stay stuck in the fantasy and we lose the intimacy skills. Mm. So there is some advantage to it. I do like that it's helping people be more open around casual sex and just getting uh, out of the dating norms and what has to be and kind of developing their own style. But then it also leads to, uh, again, you're hiding behind a screen and not really learning how to, to deal with people, which can be a problem. And also, my, I guess one of my concerns is, and it's not really a concern, more of an observation, is you know, are, we, are we building a generation of people that aren't learning, that don't know how to commit? 
you know, because they're just constantly looking for the next product on the shelf, right. you know, the next person in the line. Exactly. I do see a lot of that, especially with younger people. Mm. Or the fear of commitment, you know, if I, uh, the fear of missing out, you know, the FOMO everyone talks about, there's a lot of that around sex and relationships. You know, if I, if I uh, you know, get into a relationship or if I become monogamous, what if I miss out? Or what if there's something better? So I think we are... Even outside of sex and dating, we are bombarded with that, just in mm. marketing of products in general. Let's take the beauty industry or products like cars. You know, you need a better one, a newer one, the faster one. We really one. have been productized, haven't we? <laughs> we, have. we really have been productized. But it's affected our relationships drastically. Yeah. yeah. Um, something I'm starting to see become more of a, a normal topical conversation, and we, we, we connected on it briefly earlier, is open relationships. Mm, yes. Um, and I know most people... That are, from my experience, they don't really understand what an open relationship is. They just assume it's the ability to just go and be and be with anyone and sleep with anyone and just you know be, be a slut. And it wasn't until I read a book. Uh, the first book that I actually read on polyamory was The Ethical Slut. Oh yes, that's a good title. Oh, I a, love that. Have you yeah, have you read book. that book? I do. I have that one on my book. Brilliant show. book, and it really helped me see something new that I'd never really understood before because I have a uh, I've been exposed to polyamory I've got a relative that's been in a number of polyamorous uh, marriages and uh, I've been in open relationships myself since uh, since young ages um, but I, I, I will kind of contextualize that by saying after I did the research to understand what I was actually doing in the first place so I guess mm-hmm. where most people go wrong is I don't really understand how to define what an open relationship is right. Right. You know, uh, and they judge it. Mm-hmm. One of the things I learned was, okay, it's not just, it's about understanding that it's a lot of expectation to put on one person to have all your needs met by just one person. Mm-hmm. And we're not just talking sexual needs here. Yes. We're talking all needs. All needs. We meet yes. one person and then we go, right, it is your job to please me sexually, mentally, emotionally, entertain, humor, everything for the rest of your life. Go. Exactly. Be my best friend, my <laughs> lover, my <laughs> confidant. Yeah, my uh, masseur, <laughs> yeah, my coach, my everything. And, you know, in the ethical slut, they broke it down. I was like, you know, that's a lot of pressure and a lot of expectation. Absolutely. And we have a lot, of, we're, as human beings, our growth depends on our ability to almost service as many needs as possible, not service, uh, our ability to explore, you know, because the more we explore ourselves, the more we grow. Exactly, in and, community. And, that's and how much do we grow in relationships, right? And this is where I, I, I say to some people, okay, imagine how much growth you've just had in your last three relationships. Imagine if you had three concurrently. Imagine you've had three relationships going concurrently. Three times the growth. <laughs> three times the growth. Three times the dread, the, the pain, the trauma, the sex. But, yes. but it, is, you know, it is something that a lot of people don't really understand. So in, an, in the context of what, what we're talking about here, how do you def- define what an open relationship is to avoid judgment? Yes. You know, I don't think there's one definition, but what, how, how I look at open relationship is that there are different levels that people may take. So you may open on an emotional level, a sexual level. And I think I look at it more as designing your relationship to work for you, whether that's you and a partner, you and multiple partners. So opening up means I've realized that I'm not necessarily getting needs met or I want to explore and experience other things. So I'm bringing the uh, topic and need to my relationship or partner and we're starting at a point of exploring what that would mean for us. And I encourage people to design their relationships to work for them. And what that means is maybe we don't need to call it open or swinging or any category. Maybe it's just something that you both, if there's two of you in a relationship, come to an agreement around and can commit to. And it's an evolving contract or agreement that you have in your relationship. So I think there, there's a lot of issues around that for openness mm. where what if we don't like it? What if we get jealous? What if it doesn't work out? What if hurt feelings happen? Yes, all of that may happen. It doesn't have to be something that hinders you from going forward, but be able to commit to talking about that if that's Talking about and doing the work with whatever comes up. Exactly, and that's the fun part. I mean, it can be fun to yeah. be able to say, hey, you know, this is coming up for me, or I thought that was okay, or I'm whatever, feeling triggered, feeling overwhelmed. Do that's you find you open relationships, uh, you know, I've read a lot, a lot of um, different books that say different things, but I remember in Ethical Slut was one, they talk about how... There's a lot of people that say one of the healthiest relationships you can have is an open one. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, for some people. Again, Again think, understanding uh, that open looks different. It's not just sexuality. It can be emotional. Right. It can be intellectual. 
There's many ways that we can we can look at this. Healthy in the sense that it challenges you to be uh, vulnerable, yeah. to really be a good communicator, to be mm. really clear on what you value and believe when it comes to relationships. So I think that's something that I see people don't do often. What are my values? Is, is it important to, do I value monogamy, sex, uh, threesomes, whatever it may be? What is important to me? Most people don't know. That is mm. the common thing I see with people. I don't know what my values are. Well, I think I believe this, or is that really important? So being able to know that, I think if you're going into an open arrangement, you're going to have to be aware of that. Because people may ask you, hey, how do you feel about getting tested, uh, you know, doing these acts, boundaries, all of these different topics. So you have to be aware of that. Mm. Um, I've had many conversations with friends and, and even clients about open relationships. And I've had some people say to me, oh, I could never do an open sex relationship. I'm just way too jealous. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of when people say, oh, yeah, I've tried to meditate. My mind's just too busy. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's the whole point. That <laughs> the whole, the whole point. point of meditation <laughs> is to learn how to control that monkey mind and, and learn how to. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have a busy mind doesn't mean you can't meditate. It means that you should meditate. Exactly. And it's interesting how I got into open relationships consciously with a little bit of an unconscious pull is because I used to be a very jealous person. Mm -hmm. And I hated it about myself. I was possessive and jealous, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where I'd, I'd look at myself in disgust and go, why did you do that? Why did you say, not aggressive, not, none, none of the high, you know, the high expression behaviours, but just, you know, enough for me to go, yeah, that's, I just don't, that's, I'm not comfortable with this part of myself. I don't want to feel like I own you and I want you to feel like you're free, mm -hmm. you know? And so when I started getting into open relationships, um, it really gave me the opportunity to do the work. Exactly. To the point was like, wow, I can now be in a relationship, you know, with a, a number of people and there's zero jealousy whatsoever. And, you know, going back 15, 20 years ago, there's no way in hell I could have even conceived seeing myself in a relationship without being yes. jealous. Yes. So do you think open relationships, uh, are, they're obviously not for everyone, mm -hmm. but do you think if we approach them with a, a high level of consciousness, we can actually use them as a tool, not just to create better connections with our partner, but also to evolve you know, as a, as a spirit, as a human, as a psychology. Exactly. It can help us disconnect from ego states that are limiting us. And I think jealousy is not a negative emotion. It can yeah. be a healthy emotion because it tells you what's pushing your buttons or what's important to you. And I think absolutely it can. I think if we were more accepting of it, what I find is people want to open their relationship but there's so much fear around mm. what will people think of me. There's a lot of internal, um, you know, uh, judgment or fear of what others will think of you, even though there's this innate desire for opening up. So I, I think it, it can be a very good thing for people to do. Absolutely. Your spirit evolves, your whole being evolves because you have to be challenged in everything that you learned, all those early messages, everything that you've been bombarded with in your social conditioning gets challenged when you're opening up your relationship. To the core. Yes. Which is good. I mean, it's I think amazing. We, That's we how have we to rock grow. the boat with we, our we, psyche in order to learn and grow. If you're going to go to the gym, you've got to pick up something that's heavy. <laughs> you know, otherwise yes. there's no point going. Yes. You know? Work yourself <laughs> and yeah, make it a little hard. Yeah. Hard is not necessarily bad. I think challenge is where we grow the most and we develop because again, life is full of challenges and sex is not perfect. It mm. is the messiest, unpredictable, most... Uh, you know, diverse thing that we do. So I think we need to to expand how we look at it. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important for us to realize that open isn't a, um, uh, it's, it's not a terminal label. Mm -hmm. It can be yes. seasonal, right? <laughs> yes, that's a good way to look <laughs> yeah. at it. <laughs> okay, just because we decide to be open sexually doesn't mean you're going to have to do that forever. Exactly. It could just be an, exp it could be an exploration. Exactly. Kind of like marriage. You know, I, I, there are certain countries in the world where marriage, uh, marriage uh, agreements, uh, licenses, so to speak, expire after two years. And I think that's a wow. fascinating thing to do because then you have to reevaluate at that point. I love that. Do we want to continue this commitment? Yeah. Do we need to evolve our commitment to one another? That is so much better than this till death do us part. Uh, these vows are what we're taking to the grave. That's not really healthy for people. I think we need to encourage people to have the expectation of evolving and redesigning their relationship at every mm. point. Because I see that so much for people that start out hot and heavy, lusty, it's all about me and you. We have a family, we start our lives, we, we uh, you know, move, transition, jobs, and then they, they lose their aspect of identity through that process. Mm. And they're stuck with what was instead of what is. 
And that's a problem. One of the things that I learned that was really super, super important, and it, to me this is the basis of <laughs> strong relationships, but especially strong open relationships, uh, it's not just communication, it's that level of honesty. Yes. You know, because I know, you know, openness has been seasonal for me. You know, when I first met my wife, I was I was dating her and I was also, I was, uh, at the time I had two other open partners as well. Everybody knew. So it was all above board, which is how I've always done it. But what I found as a natural progression over time, I just discovered that I wanted to become monogamous. Like it just happened naturally mm-hmm. to the point where I committed to my wife and we, you know, we had a monogamous, a monogamous marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I found beautiful was how we got there. Mm-hmm. And we got there through this beautiful uh, tapestry of open and honest conversations that led to this incredible event. Yes. So I guess open is, is one aspect. It's where I'd say, well, I'm, I'm in an open relationship, but we've got to do the work. And would you say the most important part of that work is being open and honest with the communication? Yes. Trusting yourself. Mm. I think that's what radical honesty is. is I, I feel this way and it's okay that I feel this way and I can share that with someone without judgment, fear, criticism, or shame. And that's what healthy communication is. My partner can validate my desire, my interest, what I'm, what I'm sharing without having to agree with it. Mm. I think that can be a vital point for couples to grow. And honesty, what does that really mean? I mean, we may minimize our, our real feelings. We're, we're so used to not being honest, especially when it comes to our sexuality and our needs because of all those things, the fears, the unknowns, how will people think of me, the ego stuff. So I think it's, it's, a, it's something we need to learn. We need to learn how to be more honest and what that looks like in communication. And it mm. takes a, it's like a muscle. You have to work that muscle and build it. You gotta exercise most it. of us have been avoiding that muscle for most of our lives. Because the only time I've ever run into challenges in an open relationship is when the, the communication has either slowed or stopped or there's been confusion. Exactly. But I've found, you know, as long as there's a, a strong dialogue, hey, just checking in, how are you going? Is this, mm-hmm. you know, because I've introduced a number of people to open mm-hmm. um, and it's been a really interesting process because I would find myself every week just checking in and going, hey, look, I just want to check in, just seeing how you're going. Still feels okay. Look, if it's not, you know, we, we can talk about it. But literally just creating that moment to go, okay, where are we at? Let's just check in. You're good. Exactly. exactly. Well, I'm feeling this come up for me. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's have a little bit of a chat about that. I'm not sure this is for me. Okay, I get that. Totally respect your decision if that's what you want. And not everything that's communicated is a problem. See, mm. I think most of the time we may say something and need to do something with that. Mm. My partner's hurt. My partner is upset or my partner is feeling jealous. What do I do about it? It's really not about you. It's about understanding what that that means for the other person, mm. to be curious and understanding of someone else's experience. And I do think it's important to commit to communication as a consistent practice, uh, whether you're open or not, because I think when in any relationship do we get feedback? Hey, mm. here's what's going well, a review of what's going well, or what needs improvement. We don't really do that. So we go along thinking we're doing the right things or we're uh, addressing the needs appropriately, but we may not really know. And so that communication can also mm. be a part of that. How has sexual therapy evolved in the last hundred years? Mm, good question. I think it's uh, become more focused on the somatic, okay. you know, body-based uh, experiences. And I think it's also become more modern. You know, old psychology and psychoanalytic uh, modalities and under you know looking at everything from the perspective of early childhood is not how we're looking at sex. I would say mm. sex therapy has become more sex education and coaching as far as the modality. Solutions. People want to look at a problem or a concern and find a solution for that. They want to start feeling like they're making progress. You know, people don't want to go back into attachment, early life, and how this developed. And that may be an important aspect, but I kind of work backwards in my approach to sex therapy. Let's look at what's going on currently, Mm -hmm. what we can do to support that. It may be resources and and material that helps educate you and make you more aware. And then we may see how it's connected to relationship patterns. But I think it's evolved into a more integrated model, and I am so relieved about that. Mm. So when you say somatic, like I'm curious what you mean by that, because that's body work, right? Body work. And it may be helping people understand how their body functions, how their mind and body communicate. And so somatic work may be, especially for things like trauma or people that have had pain or discomfort around sex 
of sex, sexual activities. Somatic work helps them kind of be more in control of understanding their body's response. So for example, if someone always feels tight and uh, tense during sex, they may not realize that that's something that's coming from their mind and forming their body. Mm. So what I think somatic does more than anything is it gets people embodied in their body and mm. present with their bodies. Yeah, nice. So they're not thinking about sex from this very mental place. What am I doing? How am I gonna do it? And you know, you know ah. everything from a intellectual place, but they can experience it Be from in a the more experience. primal level. Yeah. yeah. Sex education. Um, my sex education at school, it, it was involved a banana and a condom. <laughs> the old banana. <laughs> the old banana and the condom <laughs> trick. Um, are you seeing um, sex education evolve or is, or, is, or is more work needed to be done? Especially because yes. we have so many more mm-hmm. landmines and minefields and you know, tripwires yes. now for kids than we did, you know, when, when we were going through the same thing. Right. I think it's evolving, but we still have a long way to go. I'm seeing a lot of great content come out, whether it's by experts in the field or just content available for people outside of what, what is available. Again, we talked about pornography. So I do feel that it's, it's come a long way, but we have a long way to go. I think the right and in, in accurate information is important. You know, I get discourage that everyone thinks they're a sex expert these days yeah. and can offer advice. And it's yeah. not always about advice. It's good to know the research, the clinical applications that are right for you. And so it's not just about let's figure out what to do or uh, you know do these five things and you're going to blow your partner's mind. It's about really understanding the clinical components of mm. how sexuality works and what sexual health is. So that, I feel, is a big focus now in education is what is sexual health? It's more than reproductive care. As you're saying, the condom and banana, it's more about how to use a condom. There's so many other things to understand that are components of sexual health. Mm. Where do you see sexual therapy going? I see it expanding and becoming more normalized as part of health. I see it becoming more integrated with other disciplines in the field. For example, gynecological care, urology, uh, all sorts of endocrinology, helping people understand hormone levels and how all of that Mm. affects your your sexual functioning. And I think it's becoming more remote. You know, I work with clients all over the world. So people that are in places where they don't have resources can do a teletherapy session and and access information from an expert. So I think that is, uh, again, technology is allowing us to go into places where people may have have no options other than... uh, you know, maybe a, in a conservative place, a pastor, a priest, or something that, uh, you know, a person that may not be specialized. Do so, you see the potential for sexual therapy to enter um, high school? And the reason I ask that is because I've seen, you know, an evolution. This isn't across the board. You know, schools have gone from having, you know, a school nurse, um, you know, and a guidance counselor. Right. We're now seeing some schools that are having, you know, not just a school nurse and a guidance counselor, some schools also have a, a psychologist mm-hmm. that will work with kids that are having issues, some kids at risk. Obviously, we have suicide rates now that are, you know, elevating and escalating right. all over the world. And all this, all this. Oh, and, and, I'm, I'm, and sexual identity comes into this, you know, especially in the, LG, uh, in the LGBT, I know there's more than I'm missing there, community. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a lot of new issues coming through that mm-hmm. t- teachers just have never had to deal with before. Right, right. You know, so we introduce psychologists into school. We introduce, a count- we introduce you know, a school nurse because kids get sick. Mm-hmm. Okay, we introduce a guidance counsellor because kids need guidance. We work that out. We introduce a psychologist because we realise kids need some help. Mm-hmm. Do you see at any point they're having the possibility for their being, like uh, literally a sexual therapist within schools to help kids? Because when you think about it, that's when kids get most of their shit going on from a sexual development oh, perspective. right, right. And I think our, as a culture, we are so afraid of adolescent sexuality. Mm. But that is such a prime time where you start really wiring in and conditioning yourself around your sexual uh, functioning. So I think it, I would love it. It's so hard to get into schools. Uh, A couple of colleagues and I, we tried to do sex education for adolescents, intimacy skill building, learning how to set boundaries, and parents need to be on board with that. Mm. So I think uh, schools are open to it, but if we can convince the parents how important it is to educate your adolescents, or even your younger children about understanding things that they may be hearing. Again, we have access to this information, so we may be hearing about 
what's sexual abuse? You know, how do I identify and know what that is? How mm. to talk to people if something's wrong? So uh, parents need to get on board. That's my. How uh, big of a role message. do our parents play when it comes to the formation of our sexual identity? Like I know there's some things that happen at a genetic and assault level, right, right. but outside of that, how much of a role do they play? Uh, unfortunately, a very big role because everything around sexuality is learned. So mm. if we grow up in an environment where we didn't observe even our parents being affectionate holding hands, sleeping in the same bed, being sexual beings, mm. we may uh, you know, have some voids in understanding of what sexual development is. So I think it, it's not parents' entire responsibility, but they definitely model a lot of our sexual behavior that we may take into our working models of love, relationships, our own sexual awareness. Parents uh, need to be comfortable. You know, I work with a lot of parents that say, oh, my child touched themselves and I'm so afraid of what that means or how to handle it. And uh, I normalize that. Mm -hmm. Yes, your three-year-old may touch themselves. It's just another part of the body. So I think parents also need the education and help to be able to work with their children. Mm. And I do a Mommy and Me course for uh, mothers and daughters going through menses and menstruation to just give them some tools to work mm. with. So I think it can start with something that you, you don't have to have all the answers, but ask for help. There's a, a lot of great resources that are gauged to helping parents provide the right sex ed. Yeah. I what's think, appropriate, what's not, what should I talk about? I do think parents have a disproportionate responsibility, though. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Like, yes. Because when you look at, uh, it's not, I'm not just looking at sex here and sex issues, I'm looking at, you know, when we look at any issues that evolve over time, mm -hmm. addiction especially, when we look at the, the roots of addiction from the maladaptive brain development in the earlier years when, you know, kids were stressed and they didn't have that parent showing them how to regulate, you know, if anything, they had a parent reinforcing the stress mechanism. Um, should every parent like literally be considering mm -hmm. a game plan when it comes to sitting down with their children and talking about sexuality? And if so, at what age do you start that conversation? Or should that just be a part of everyday life conversation? It should be a part of everyday life. I think the younger, the better. Again, mm -hmm. a, a three-year-old or four-year-old, they may discover their bodies. You don't have to give them a college anatomy lesson, but be open to helping them identify proper names for genitals, you know, helping them understand that, yes, their, their body is, they can touch themselves and it's not uh, wrong, shameful, or dirty. You know, we don't want to encourage behavior outside of their developmental age, but also not be afraid of it if it comes up. Mm. I hear so many people, no matter what the age, say, I didn't get any sex education. My parents never talked about sex. We, uh, I was handed a book and expected to know what to do with that. So I think uh, parents can definitely be guiders and help navigate. But again, it's, it's not entirely, entirely their responsibility. Schools I think as a, as a culture, as yes, a society. Absolutely. There's a bigger collective there's a, responsibility. There's a, there's a village responsibility. Right, right. Um, but when we look at our culture right now, it's almost like we live in this culture that is over-sexualized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, you read stories about these kids that are being put into pageants at the age of eight. And um, I'm curious to know, are kids being over-sexualized mm -hmm. because of technology and media and everything else? I think yes, because again, that is connected to the marketing of how we, you know, what should be important to us, how we want to view things. Uh, so it gets kind of confused with the social messages around uh, what people are exposed to. But I also think that it could be, uh, you know, it's not really society's fault, but it's how you use that material. Mm. Also, if you're a parent and you're allowing your children to be exposed to this material, it's not about necessarily censoring that, but just explaining what it is. Yeah, that's something that's for, it's not for children, or being able to talk about it rather than just avoid it. Mm. The avoidance, I think, creates more confusion. Again, we're not going to be able to censor everything, but we can talk about why we may not find it appropriate for a young child, mm. for example, to watch something uh, that's going to influence them negatively. Or sexualized, uh, you're talking about pageants and things like that. I, I think that we, we mix up the messages or how people may understand their sexuality mm. based on that. And not to say that pageants are over-sexualizing kids, but you just see that being brought into the mix when you get these five-year-olds that have been you know, dolled up with makeup to look like... You know, beauty ideals yeah. or putting a lot of focus on being perfect and being judged by your appearance, that's a part of sexuality. You know, mm. there's so many body image issues and we're not born hating our bodies. We learn that through all of these messages, but can we help 
uh, not expose our children to that material, right? If you're looking at all these magazines or shows and, and messages that are affecting how you feel about yourself, maybe you need to find new material. There's mm. a lot of good information out there and not all of it has to be this sensationalized, beauty-focused, youth-focused uh, material that we see. Mm. Brilliant stuff. We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> we sure have. I mean, sex and we could go on for days. <laughs> is there anything that we haven't covered, covered that you're finding is a, you know, a topical piece right now? You know, I think uh, just sex therapy in general, it's not just about, you know, therapy can sometimes be taboo. I think a lot of sex therapy is just sex education and that everyone needs sex education no matter mm. what age they're at. You know, sometimes I'll work with people in their 80s who are having the best sex of their lives and they're wow. looking for tools and tips and they want to learn about, you know, contraception and all of these other things to protect them from STIs. It's just important that no matter what age you're at, sexuality never ages and it's a part of your lifespan. So it's uh, important that sexuality is addressed, whether it's in therapy or education, at any age. Nice. And stage. <laughs> so uh, we've got quite a broad audience, but if there was one piece of advice that you'd leave all the listeners with, what would be the best piece of What's the best piece of advice you could give people? You are responsible for your own orgasm and your own pleasure. And a partner is not going to give you an orgasm, is not responsible for figuring that out. You have to do your own work. You have to explore your body and be in control of that mm. and then have a partner be a part of that. Wow. So, uh, Well, you kind of covered that something that we didn't talk about is the importance of knowing how to satisfy self. Yes. Because oftentimes we do, we do put that pressure or people can put that pressure on their partner and go, well, it's your job to make me orgasm. Exactly. Well, do you know how to do it? No. It's all, how, how am I supposed to do something? I don't, don't know, even, but it's you It's your body. Know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. That is the biggest crux I see with couples. Yeah. My partner didn't give me an orgasm. My partner is not pleasing me. And I'll put it right on that person. It's your responsibility. You've got to touch yourself. You've got to masturbate. You've got to do the things you need to do to figure out how your body works, mm. especially women. You know, men are different. You see your penis. It's right there. You get to hold it, be with it. You know, it's, it's a part of your body. Females, oh, the majority of women never look at their genitals. Wow. But then they feel shame about what a partner may see, wow. or what a partner may smell or taste or, or all of that. So I, I have them just Get in there, explore your body, be comfortable with your body, be nude in a non-sexual way. Mm. I've seen a lot of work from people, improvement in how they feel in their body image by just, I got home and I walked around in the nude and I had my tea or a glass of wine and I just felt free in my body where I wasn't covering or tightening or sucking in or any of those things that I often do because I'm conscious of my body. Wow. So... Yes. Dr. Shannon Chavez, what an incredible <laughs> conversation. We went anywhere and everywhere. And everywhere, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much it's for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on Unstoppable. Thank you. Unstoppable sex. <laughs> Unstoppable sex. <laughs> this episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say and your reviews. Make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray.